So, good morning, dear artists, dear speakers, dear audience here in Berlin at Akademie der Künste, dear digital audience. Welcome to the second day of our performative conference, Unexpected Lessons, Decolonizing Memory and Knowledge. So we had an inspiring and intense day yesterday. Um, we had a very crowded um, program with a keynote from Nana Ofuyata Ayim. Um, Felvin Sa was with us. Uh, they were talking with Aisha Diallo. The artists El Zambala and Natalie Anguizo Mumba Bikuru were performing. They had a talk with Magnus Elias Rosengarten. So it was a wonderful day yesterday, but we also have an interesting program ahead of us, um, starting in a minute with the panel Black European Studies Mapping Academia. We have a, pro a program from Nairobi as yesterday, um, today with the title The Other Objects. We will see some films, have an input by Nadia Yala Kizukidi on uh, African philosophy, a poetry performance by Laya Aukongo, an input by Carmen Mersch and Nora Landkammer on colonialities and education in museums, and um, a final panel, uh, Repenser l'histoire d'art this afternoon, and a performance by Sylvia Kiambi, a Kenya-based artist. So let's now start um, with the panel Black European Studies, hosted by my colleague Maret Ifuma Kupka. The talk will be held in German. For the live stream, um, we have a German live stream and an English live stream. The only exception is the last panel this afternoon at 5.30, which will be held in French with a German translation. So let me introduce Marit to you. Marit is an art scholar, freelance writer and curator of fashion, body and performance at the Museum Angewandte Kunst in Frankfurt am Main. In her exhibitions, lectures, texts and interdisciplinary projects, she addresses the issues of the future memory culture, representation and the decolonization of art and cultural practices in Europe and on the African continent. She's a member of the advisory board of the Initiative Schwarze Menschen in Deutschland e.V. and spokesperson for the Neue Deutsche Museumsmacherin. Maret, I wish you a nice conversation with your guest, which you will, um, who you will introduce in a minute. Um, the floor is yours. Thank you very much for being with us today in the Akademie der Künste in Berlin, Natasha and Peggy. I'd like to introduce you first. I almost forgot Vanessa because she's dialed in from Switzerland. Unfortunately, she can't be with us today. Peggy Piescher is a researcher in literature and culture focus, black European studies, racism, power, critical reflection. Born and grew up in the GDR, she studied in both East and West Germany and indeed in Russia. She's written about racified black imagery, collective memory, and she works for the Bundeszentrale Politische Bildung, where she is in charge of the department, political education and plural democracy, with a focus on diversity, intersectionality and decoloniality. She's an activist herself and a member of ADEFA, Black Women in Germany, and also ASWOT, Association for the Worldwide Study of the African Diaspora. And she's an activist and researcher in and for the black community in Germany. Then next to me, we have Natasha A. Kelly, who wrote her PhD in communication studies. She's also a sociologist with a focus on colonialism and feminism. She was born in the UK, but grew up in Germany. She writes, she's a curator, she lectures. She's worked at many German and Austrian universities, and I believe in the United States, or is that forthcoming? Perhaps a bit more in the USA, forthcoming. She works at the Center for Transdisciplinary Gender Research at the Humboldt University in Berlin, at least until 2013. And at least you did work there for a while on decoloniality of knowledge and power and being. And your dissertation on creative work links theory with practice at the interface between 
academia, society, and art. You've also been active in the black community in Germany for many years. I'd also like to welcome Vanessa E. Thompson, a sociologist at the Department of Social and Cultural Anthropology in the Viadrina University in Frankfurt Oder. She also researches in black studies with a special focus on black social movements. But she's also written critique of post-colonial feminisms, abolitionism, and contemporary history. She's written about black radical history in France and Europe, black abolitionist struggles. She's published on those subjects, and she was co-founder of a Cop Watch collective. She's also a member of the International Independent Commission for Declaration, uh, investigation into the death of Uri Jalo and works in a number of research networks. So that's just the framework. Today, we're going to be talking about black studies, black German studies, black European studies, which is a broad field. We have a little over an hour. Then I'd like to pass over to our audience and open it up about 10 or 15 minutes before we run out of time. So, audience, you have the chance to think over your questions. And a few people will be walking around here picking up questions, which we can then answer. Or at least we'll try to answer them. We'll see. I would like to ask you, following my very general idea and introduction, if you could say something about yourselves and how you see your role within black studies. How do you position yourselves and what does black studies mean for the work that you're doing? Who's going to start? Natasha has the mic. Is it on? It is. Great. OK, well, good morning. And thank you very much for the invitation. Best wishes to Switzerland, Vanessa. It's great that you're with us virtually. How I would position myself? Well, I think that, first of all, I think it's important to say that in the German context, there is no such thing as black studies yet. It's not been institutionalized anyway. But I do believe that a lot of academics in various different spheres are working on this terrain, as I am. So I would position myself at the intersection between academia and art, in fact, because through communication studies and through visual communication, I somehow fell into the art sphere at some point and tried to link these things. And that corresponds to my idea of black studies, because I do think it's an applied study or discipline, or should be, where theory and practice can inform one another. But something else I think is important is approaches that we have seen more of in the US context need to be transposed for Europe. And I think it's very important that we don't take things on just one to one, but we really do translate them into our own context and adjust them and then apply them appropriately. Because I think it's really important, like a lot of traditions, of course, black traditions and black knowledge traditions and narratives often started in practice before they reached the theoretical level. And I think the same applies to Germany. I think all of us have done a great deal as practitioners, as political activists. And I think it's really important that this informs our research in whatever form. Of course, from my point of view, I would prefer a liberal arts approach, meaning that art we understand in a broader sense. The arts in the Anglo-Saxon sense. In Germany, when you say Kunst, it tends to be restricted to art history, the history of fine arts. But I'm talking about the arts, 
a liberal arts approach with space for creativity. And when I say creativity in this context, I mean both the skills, the craft, but also the intellectual cognitive effort. Cognitive creativity is just as important, in my view, as hands-on art and production as such. And something that's really important to me is to found this on an Afrocentrism rather than a Eurocentrism, so that we're not all the time trying to work through the structures we have, but that we take that creativity in its diversity, not just being critical, but actually being proactive and creative ourselves. Well, that would be my start. Well, it certainly illustrates how broad this terrain is, and I'm sure that we will come back to that and look at it in depth, because you've mentioned a lot of things there that I also think are important to talk about. Peggy. Thank you. First of all, thank you very much for the invitation. It's wonderful that we have this symposium. Decolonizing knowledge, decolonizing memory, I think is exactly what we need to place in the focus in approaching these questions. Institutionally, we don't have black studies in Germany in the sense of having a center or a university course. But I think from an activist perspective, we can say that we've been around for some decades. And I would include myself in that and position myself as part of a process, a movement f towards intersectional black studies, which is where we're moving towards. So we're not reinventing the wheel. We have our activist background, but also with our knowledge position. We can build on things that have happened before. And our cognitive and emotional approaches have been facilitated by that, as Natasha has just said. There is a lot of black knowledge deriving from movements and from practice, and often from feminist movements with intersectionality approaches and black feminism, which are also knowledge approaches. They're about knowledge production. For Germany, that means that if we look at the landscape there, Certainly, decolonialization has to be a focus, because otherwise, we are only going to be moving around on a level of legitimating white knowledge. And that is perhaps an impossible situation. We might be fed statistics about, about why things aren't relevant enough or why we're not a critical mass. We are a critical mass. We've already seen that in 1986 in, the, in books that have been published, in displaying color as an initiative. All of these things have been worked on, but not necessarily flagged up. But these are all factors that have to feed into the process. And of course, self-efficacy, self-proclamation of blacks above all in the feminist movement in the 80s and 90s. And I would go so far as to say that if we're talking about knowledge production, it's not simply important to look at what has spilled over from outside, but a lot of this is based here, critical or critique of whiteness is also embedded in black German experience. We saw that in 2005 with the book on myths, masks, and subjects, where we tried to illustrate this for the discourse in the German language. And contradictory experience has shown us repeatedly that we have to de-economize. This isn't just about an alien experience that doesn't apply to us. We have a colonial story in Germany, too, which we need to take on board. And something else we need to look at is what traveling concepts there are. 
where there is black knowledge experience in Germany and Europe, which has been pushed. Thinking of our scholars and academic activists, our siblings, who only received academic legitimation here once they had been forced to go into Anglophone countries to pursue their work first. I think Vanessa can talk to us a lot more about that. And one last basic thought on this. At the moment, we find ourselves at a stage of materialization, I would hope, of intersectional black studies. And in this phase, where we are looking at institutions, administrations, government responsibility, and entering into negotiation with that. We've seen that in our initiative for people of African origin. All these things that I mentioned would obviously have to feed into that process to make it clear that the people are here. We have the people. We have our professors. We have people who haven't been given professorships or lectureships yet, but are certainly have the knowledge, and we need to decolonize knowledge so that people have the legitimation. Interesting to look at Audrey Lord as a guest lecturer at the TU or Misha Unga now has a role here. And I think this is a window of opportunity we have that we need to tackle together. We need an interface, of course, with the activist movements that we can build on so that we can institutionalize on that basis. Thank you, Peggy. I think it's great that we also are not all completely different, but have different perspectives in this panel, which I think illustrates the spectrum we're talking about here for black studies, at least in Germany. It has to have a broad spectrum, and that is a challenge in itself to do justice to all these things. And now the third person, third position, third positioning, perhaps, Vanessa. Yes, thank you from me, too, for the invitation. I'm delighted to see you. Of course, it's a shame it's only virtual on my part. And thank you to you and to Marit. for organizing this event. Also, thank you to the technicians who've made this possible. For all the invisible work backstage to make this event possible. I think I'd like to start by looking back a little to the institutionalization of black studies in the United States. Is that a model that we want to adopt? I'm not necessarily saying that. But I think we need to think fundamentally about the institutionalization of black studies, and that helps us to do it. The first black studies programs were sent up in the 60s and were very closely linked to the black power movements the anti-war movement, the anti-terrorist movement. It had a lot to do with Vietnam. But there were also indigenous groups, Native Americans, Hispano-Americans, and so forth. And black studies then were linked to the Black Student Union in California State. Which, was, which talked about the third liberation in that context. So black studies means to me primarily, and Peggy referred to that, the importance of this commitment to emancipation, not just for black people, for everyone, but not only. And I think the history shows that quite clearly, because we might call it 
a kind of segregation. To what extent has this institutionalization, does it involve pitfalls that we can learn from? Looking at the United States, for example, the emergence of the black middle class or the reinforcement of that process, also against the background of realizing that institutionalization always incurs a risk of depoliticization. I think it's really important to see, and that's how I understand black studies, that study and critique of Western civilization are part of it, but so is the possibility to think about new world utopias or the imaginary that relates to new worlds. And it comes from many different directions. So black studies always has to be transdisciplinary, as Natasha's already said, and she referred to the arts. But I would also relate to the other sciences, physics, medicine, and so forth. Black studies is transdisciplinary in its emancipation project. And I think that's important because, of course, there is a lot of lack of knowledge. We've heard about decolonialization, but black people and others, other marginalized groups who have generated counter-knowledge, counter-hegemonic knowledge, they've always done this, and I think that's important to recognize. We can't think about revolutions without thinking about counter-movements. We can't think about any movement without counter-hegemonial knowledge. Knowledge is not monadic, and it's always based on some kind of experience, which, of course, is not the whole story. So there's always been black studies in that sense everywhere. But the institutionalization of black studies is something that, in the European context, and is really important. In Germany, there isn't really an institutionalized form of black studies, but nor is there in France and in a lot of other parts of Europe. I think Britain has played a special role. We can talk about that later. I'm saying that because for me, black studies is always transnational. So I would talk about international black studies, I think, because we've seen in the United States that this methodological nationalism there incurs its own problems, and they are being increasingly tackled now. So how can we talk about transnational or international black studies as part of that third liberation front? I think it's important to stress that black studies is always being done and always has been done historically. It's always involved networking, not just looking at important figures like Boyce or Audrey Lorde, of course, but also Claudia Jones, activists who were deported, black communists who then carried on their work in Europe, but always in this transnational fabric. I don't think you can think about black studies without that, let alone do it. Doing black studies has always had a transnational aspect, or I'd say an internationalist aspect to it. And last point I would raise is this question of decolonization, which I think is an important factor. Because black studies, or let's say black studies is understood as black radical epistemology and knowledge production linked to struggles, very material struggles. Those are always decolonialization movements, but not just at a metaphorical level or a representational level. They can move away from that. And it's important, I think, to look at the work done by scholars warning against making decolonialization a metaphor and dematerialization the debate. Decolonize means, above all, land back and 
how do we position ourselves towards settlement projects. And it can't just be about setting up study courses. So I think on the one hand, you've got the question of institutionalization. But linked to that is the question of how we institutionalize, how we make that input, and what are the pitfalls and the dangers. And Robin Kenny, somebody that I was able to learn a great deal from with regard to the establishment of black studies and the history of the institutionalization of black studies, always says that, and puts it very nicely, that black studies wasn't just extramural, it wasn't just outside the university, it was also a counter to the universities as we know them. So we're talking about dismantling a neoliberal, colonialized form of university, which increasingly has become a commercialized operation and systematically economizes knowledge. So I think it's not just about institutionalization. It's also about how we institutionalize, where do we want to move into, and can we do this solely on the university campus? Do we want that? Perhaps I could pick up on that. Perhaps I could clarify a misunderstanding. If you ask me, physics and architecture and all of those disciplines are part of the arts. That's why I tried a moment ago to open up this idea. Architecture is part of the arts. Physics or metaphysics is also part of the arts. Art is often written in a very narrow way in a Eurocentric context, but these are all methods and methodologies which in my view, in the broader sense of the term, signify art, the arts. The German term Kunst which is only the fine art sort of waters this down, but I think all of those disciplines are part of this architecture. In particular, you can see the physicality of creation there. So I don't want to have people putting words into my mouth. I don't want to have people getting the rung into the stick. We need to think about what the arts actually means. That would be a different panel, but just to make sure we're all on the same page there. Well, thank you, Natasha, for clarifying. And yes, I think that might be a slightly different panel, but then again, there would be links with what we're talking about here as well, because it really underlines the challenge, not necessarily the difficulty, but the challenge of talking about these issues. I think it's become clear that looking at black studies, German black studies, black international studies, whatever we wish to call it, it's not about opening up an institute or a university and setting up professorships and then operating within that institution. It's about a great deal more than that. Vanessa touched upon this at the end of her comments. It's about dismantling ideas and rethinking and reinventing institutions and also working against the grain of or counter to the institutions. So there's the question of all the concepts, the terminology which is available to us and what we have at our fingertips doesn't necessarily fit. Therefore, let me ask all three of you, what can we actually do? Is there some way is there some kind of strategy? I like to talk about strategies as a matter of fact, because I don't believe that there is one single recipe to resolve these issues, one single approach. I think a strategic approach is what we require. So what do you think would be the kind of steps that could be taken, the kind of strategies that could be adopted, the kind of realms we could operate in? in order to have something which would function in a counter-institutional way. Peggy. A counter-institutional approach, well, I don't really know. The idea of being against something or counter is always an interesting one. I like to... I was interested, Vanessa, to hear what you said to say about 
the course of history, but there's a dilemma we often face that we're against a counter approach, and that absorbs an enormous amount of energy. Now, I can do that, and I really can get up in arms and be really vehement. We often have to do that, and what I would view as a dilemma is the fact that we have to do multiple things at the same time. We look to the institutions, we're seeking to decolonize them. But we need to ensure we don't get bogged down in that because that is a box, a categorization. We're put in a drawer. So we said, well, we're against traditional, conventional knowledge. We're intersectional, it's black knowledge. Intersectional also means solidarity with knowledge production of other vulnerable groups, with other racified and marginalized groups. And we don't want to get stuck dealing solely with that. We don't want to get backed into that corner. We need to be aware of that so we can open it up at any point in time. We need to look at our own movements as well and ask what it means in tangible, specific terms. Decolonizing knowledge, making headway on that front. What does it mean? We're looking at institutionalization of intersectional black studies. And that means for BIPOC people, this has to be made available so that it's accessible, so that there's a way in. Center for Political Education. Part of my task is to turn the spotlight on precisely these people and say also for us. There are these colonialized institutions. All institutions have a colonial history. We don't want these institutions to be handing on traditions now without reflection. What needs to be done differently is the following. We need to look at situation say, no, your knowledge and know-how and expertise is in the foreground, and you also have the right to political education. That's why we supported this symposium as well, because it's important. Decolonization is important for society, but it's also important for various groups within society, which is also something that we are. So there's a question of focusing upon ourselves, focusing on the marginalized groups on other groups. And it's not just about working through standards, where is this establishment, who's the head of the establishment, how many courses are there on this particular topic. It's really about making the whole thing transparent and accessible to BIPOC people. And furthermore, there's a lot of work we always have to do, often really burning the midnight oil, really burning the candle at both ends because we're doing all kinds of different things in our professional capacity and over and beyond that. And that's something which I think is enormously urgently important, particularly for the German context when it comes to intersectional black studies. It's important to look at this whole realm of structural racism and to tackle that in a way that it's possible to debate that within our society. Here we don't have any tradition of talking about structural racism. And there's not a clear basis of knowledge legitimacy on that front in Germany. And that means that the knowledge production in all of these realms is important, as you said, Natasha. So of course that 
all needs to be on board intersectional black studies, black studies in Germany really applies on all fronts. And adopting a strategy also means bringing home my people, bringing home the knowledge of my people. That's a lengthy process as well. It means looking in directions that are not pre-legitimated through existing systems and structures. Yes, I wanted to hand over to you in a moment, but I also wanted to say a few words on that myself as well. Just a thought. On the one hand, I can see the need for international black studies, but I also think, and it's, I'm pleased that you said that, Peggy, as well in Germany, there's a very specific history, a particular genesis of our history as well. So I think it's very important to address that. And that can feed into something which could then be international black studies. So we're working on different fronts and different contexts. That's very important, I think. And I wanted also to mention your book, Natasha, where you talked about racism and about racism in Germany and about structural racism. You talk about that, you write about that. And perhaps that looks different, perhaps it has different specificities in Germany than other contexts. analysis. Before I come on to that, I would really like to say a few words on the topic of strategies. I think it's enormously important to remember there shouldn't be a strategy. There's not one way or one route. I think it's very important to bear in mind that there are different strategies, different approaches, which can indeed converge. As to the book Fava Bekken, Showing Our Colors, I think that's one of the most important books. There's a whole host of others, but this is really outstanding. But if you ask me, it has not been concluded. It was part of a process, and that process continues. It's not just a self-contained book. As I was saying at the beginning, one strategy is decolonization. Of course, that functions in terms of structures. You have to decolonize those structures. But there's another opportunity and another approach as well to go into the gaps, into the interstices, and to be creative in those gaps, to continue recounting those stories that were presented with Showing Our Colors and other such books. Parallel to what you're saying, I don't want to contradict what you're saying at all, not in the slightest. That's also what urgently has to be done so that we can really strengthen our situation as black Germans, as Afro-Germans, to identify ourselves perhaps subsequently as BIPOC. Now, we mustn't neglect that work. I'm thinking of the next generations as well, our children, my children, they constantly need their own empowering training and education. I would think that that is my focus. Although, of course, you can never look at this in a vacuum separated from the institutions, whether we go into the institutions or create something of our own. We're nonetheless part of a large overarching matrix, and therefore think that it's fair to say that we need to have both of these approaches as to what you're saying about transnational or international approaches. I like this idea of thinking in terms of gaps, what we can do in the gaps and interstices, and that's why I take this kind of diaspora approach. For me, the term nation is a clearly Eurocentric construct. So I'm seeking to distance myself from that and to move beyond that and in that context, the diaspora approach, which is also a part of what being black signifies, is much more decisive from my own proactive and creative development 
rather than always having to be the critical one. We always are forced into wearing the hat of critic, but within a diasporic approach, we don't have to justify our being black. Then that's a realm in which we can reconceive being black, and we can also reconceive what being German means as well. If we start off with the book Farbe Beken showing our colors, where does that take us? In institutional terms as well, and that tends to be my strategy, the approach that I've adopted. So it's about opening up spaces on a small scale as well, and hopefully at some point in time they'll become larger. We're currently negotiating with North Rhine-Westphalia. The discussions are going very well. That's one of the federal states in Germany. We're looking at scope to fund, I don't know if calling an institution is a bit much, but I'm going to call it a space to fund a space, whether that should be done and indeed will be done. And that brings us back to the question of structures. In my last publication, I tried to make this very clear. Since last summer, things have gone a little bit off the rails. Racism has been boiled down to individual experience and individual actions. And the work of very important academics that's been done over the last 30 years has been entirely ignored and pushed aside as if we'd never existed, as if all of our works had never existed. Again and again, whenever I've been interviewed, I've insisted on stressing that racism is a structural phenomenon, it's an ideology that affects all societies, and depending, of course, upon the shape that society takes. Racism takes a different shape as well. There was the question as to whether there is racism in Germany. I didn't even answer that question. And I said, well, yes, what's the next question? They always tried to compare the situation with the United States. That always came next. Well, racism in Germany isn't as bad as in the United States. And I thought, that's the wrong way to look at this. It isn't the right way to address these issues because we have our independent form of society, which has grown and developed, and racism has permeated these structured, just as racism has developed. And if we're not careful, we'll be stuck with that for the next 500 years into the future as well. And I think that these structures do exist. They're pre-established. The strategies that you're talking about, the way that I look at this is that we have to consider how best to deal with that as part of our strategies, writing something that goes against the grain. Being constantly in opposition is always tiring, as you said already. It means a two-fold effort. That's one approach, but you can also create a space or go to the few spaces that do exist. Perhaps there are slightly augmenting since last summer. Let's hope that that process continues so that we can move into those spaces and establish something sustainable. Institutions, disciplines, centers, I don't know what we really ultimately want to call all of these components. It's also a political momentum underpinning this as well, and who knows how long this will last. I would like to come back to Vanessa's strategies in a moment as well. There's something else that occurred to me, an idea pertaining to counter-histories and counter-realities. That doesn't necessarily mean that you have to be in opposition and to push against the grain, but to create something of your own that automatically will be somehow a counter-space. Perhaps you could say a few words on that. Well, yes, I'm against the idea of being against something. I'm against being against, because that presumes something else which structures your thinking, and that's exactly what I would like to liberate myself from. That's why I say an Afrocentric perspective offers a foundation that I think is not at all in contradiction with the idea of intersectionality or other black feminist approaches. It simply offers 
a space that moves beyond the Eurocentric space. In that Eurocentric space, we have to quite clearly present a counter-narrative. We can move into another space. And of course, Afrocentrism was also a counter-movement to the Eurocentric approach. It's not entirely free, but we're free in that realm, nonetheless, of the constraints of the Eurocentric approach. We're freer. Let's say we can move more freely. We're far from being completely free, which is, of course, the prime goal. But we'll have more cognitive freedom to think about things in a different way, rather than constantly demarcating ourselves from something else. It's a different strategy, and I think that both can exist, and indeed perhaps should exist. After all, we are a small community. We don't have this huge mass that you have in the United States that might enable us to implement something more rapidly. In numbers, statistics is quite another problem as well. That's also part of the overall parcel as well. Well, yes, I'd like to say a few words about the German community as well, but let's hand over now to Vanessa, because there's always so the strategy question as well. What can we do? What do you do? What are your approaches? Well, yes, we've heard so many different points. I'd like to say a few words about the idea of being against black struggle, black combats epistemology are always more than just one thing. If you ask me, you have movements which act against enslavement, but always have to put forward new approaches. It's not a binary either or. Afrocentrism had a great deal more to it. So we have these struggles, epistemologies, and visions and practices. I don't think that we can understand them by just by boiling them down to opposition. I would totally agree with all of you on that. But there's also a very important dynamism to that as well, because there is an epistemological aspect of this as well as the question of oppositional knowledge of civil disobedience that always encompasses more also, to reference with what arises out of that, abolitionist movements, traditions, theories, and perspectives are essential because they make clear that the idea was to move away from enslavement economies and to actively struggle against those and destroy them, but at the same time, new Worlds have always opened up, so at the same time, simultaneously, you're also opening up new worlds. So being against is not just about being against. And I would perhaps call this, in a way, as refusal and recreation. There's always something about making worlds to this as well. And I think that black studies and the black struggle and black epistemologies are all part and parcel of this idea of making new worlds, their crucial contribution to that, and always part and parcel of it. Ultimately, I don't think that you can really separate them. There's the question of when you're working more against something, how you can strike a balance. I think it's important to strike the proper equilibrium, but I don't think you should think about either or, and it's the same with local and global. Of course, it's quite obvious the transnational or international diasporic or planetary black studies, you could call them all of these things. There's various different concepts in black theory formation, looking at the way in which black experiences are intermeshed. That also goes for the epistemologies, the struggles, and the experiences, they're all interwoven. It's important to talk about those, because black studies is not just one thing. It's all about different approaches, theoretical approaches as well. Epistemological strategies focusing more on Afrocentrism, some looking more at planetary approaches. There's 
different understandings of the term racism. There's the Afro-pessimists as well as another notion as well as the black radical tradition. I think it's important to remember that black studies is not one single homogenous project. And therefore, that's also why we have an entire research area where there are different approaches and different formations and configurations. And I think that the idea of local and global that you picked up on is also very important because the one doesn't exclude the other, specifically with reference to Germany and to other countries in continental Europe. There are so many continuities of exclusion as to black academic scholarship and black presence, and they need to be brought on board. Some of you already drawn attention to the various different important publications, the formation of knowledge, the archives as well. All of which we need to continue working on because this knowledge is there, this theory formation is there. But I also think it's important to look at how this links in to the global intermeshing, as Natasha said. It's also about looking at Eurocentric knowledge systems and calling those into question and decolonizing them. And for me, the category of the nation is part and parcel of that, as is being German. It's not just about the decolonization of being German. It's more about black studies being abolishing the nation state and recreating something else as well. That also goes for national understandings of the terms and national vantage points, and I would say diasporic, yes, but also planetary. And we have to bear in mind there's a whole myriad of different approaches in black studies. The other point I want to say relates to strategies. I would very much agree with you that they're very diverse and they also transform and are metamorphosed. And I think you need to think about in which realm and space you use which strategy. I think organization is one vital strategy. Find your people. What does it mean to break out of individualization? And that's something that we see in Germany, particularly through the book and the project showing our colors, breaking out of isolation and individualization and thinking as a collective and intervening on that basis as well, and collectively creating the spaces to create something anew. There's always calls for people to decolonize curricula, but there's also study groups where students are doing this under their own steam. It was very much my experience as a student. I looked at Cesar Winter, for example, and many other writers. That was something I had to appropriate in parallel to the actual course, not just looking at the content of the seminars, but people are taking these rooms for themselves, creating them for themselves. I think that's very important also as a teacher as well and a lecturer to think about what students need so that they can also have access in these spaces to these long-standing traditions of knowledge formation, radical theories and epistemologies that also always go hand in hand with practice as well. So if you look at the university context, it's also about supporting students, helping them to get access to these forms of knowledge and also to do teaching differently. Disrupting the university as we know it, shaping our lecture theatres, our classrooms differently, teaching differently. It's not just about decolonizing the curriculum, but there's also the question of which knowledge we take seriously, how we deal with inputs, with contributions in the 
classroom and the lecture theatre, that's one strategy to actively support students and to teach differently as well. Furthermore, if we don't focus just on students and curricula and anti-discrimination policies, if we don't just reduce it to that, then it's always linked to something else as well that I think is important, and that's the question of the neoliberal university. What about employment structures? What about people who do the cleaning work? They're not there as university staff. They're not students, but they're often people of colour. They're often black. Black studies is also materialist struggle and formation. We need to say that as well, to think about the decolonisation of universities as the big picture. It's about transforming the employment situations and the exploitation relations within that un university structure and also beyond it as well. So that's important so when we think about decolonisation. I've done some seminars with students on this, looking at the question of how we can understand this as a transnational movement where there's always a focus on the curriculum and architecture of universities, but also on the question of solidarity. For example, with the South African cleaners, they've had strikes and so on, because otherwise, if you don't link all those elements up, and I think this is important as well, by the way, we've seen in the US there's a lot of positive criticism. There's the question of domestication as well. And by that I mean the institutionalization of black studies can, in a sense, decouple it from the radical movements. There's formations of critical black studies, critical ethnic studies, because we do need to bear in mind that in the US, black studies have become institutionalized. But at the same time, the industrial penitentiary complex came into being. So I think strategies are important, but we need to think about liberation, not just in institutions, but beyond the institutions. And if we think that there's a simultaneity here when it comes to the institutionalization of black studies, and yet at the same time, the impoverishment of the black populace and the incarceration of the black population, there's also the question of who led Black Lives Matter, not just in the US, but in Europe as well. How do these struggles come into being is also a key question as well. It was above all the working class. The poor, the people, they're the ones who put their lives on the line. What does it mean to think about institutionalization of black studies from that perspective as well? That the life of most of those in the black community should become better. That's part of the story as well. So I think our lodestone shouldn't just be the institution. I think the lodestone ought to be a commitment to black liberation struggles and visions and building new worlds. And I think that it's very important there. To look to how we can tie this in to struggles, to look beyond just the framework of Germany. So it was very important for me to think about this idea of being embedded and not looking at these aspects in isolation one from another, not isolating what's happening in universities and institutions and thinking about what it means against the backdrop of the increasing economization of education as well. How, that's the question of how we can even imagine black studies in Germany. Thank you, Vanessa. I would actually like to add another topic to the saucepan. We had a panel yesterday on healing, and Natalie Anguzumus said something important and fantastic. She said colonialism would be over when Europe died. Of course, you have to see that in context as a statement. So I would suggest that at this point, because it's all being recorded, that we take a look at yesterday. The panel was about healing and 
I spend a lot of time on the internet, in forums. I read, sometimes I join the discussion. And something I come across a lot there is a lot of pain. Last year, and it's still going on, for example, the colorism issue, which cropped up again. Of course, in the context of Black Lives Matter, it's become more virulent, it's become reinforced, it was discussed even more vehemently. vehemently. I think there's a lot of non-knowledge out there, or let's say knowledge, lack of knowledge and pain are all mixed. I'm not saying that's a bad thing, it's a fact. And I'm not offering a value judgment here. But what can you do about it? What, how can you use this? How can you build on it? Would black studies in Germany be black planetary studies or black German studies? Would it be a place where knowledge can be imparted? Obviously, we've spoken about that already, and that's important that we can impart narratives, impart knowledge. But what about healing? How can this pain that underlies all these issues find a space for expression and healing come about? I think that's very important because one is constantly responding out of acute pain or acute lack. That's not necessarily healthy. Can I say something about that? Because I really do think that that fits in well with the project I'm working on at the moment in North Rhine-Westphalia. There were cases of racism in the theater in Dusseldorf where two of my plays were going to be performed. And we as a whole ensemble, 23 people, withdrew and made demands. We said, we're not here to clean up. We said, we're here to do art, and we don't want our plays, black as they may be, to be a seal of blackness, a kind of certification. They have their own autonomous role to play, and we want them to be seen as that. We wrote an open letter with three clear demands that we formulated. The first was that the case, or several cases, because more came to light in the process, should be investigated and work should be done on them. Also, we need to talk about being paid when you're not actually working, when your work has been suspended. And also, this is an autonomous stage. It needs to be a space, theater, center, institution, or whatever. That's part of the vision. So we entered into talks both with the city of Dusseldorf and, above all, with the federal state of North Rhine-Westphalia. There were several rounds of talks, and now we've received a pledge that we can develop the concept for a three-year stage. I'm going to call it a stage, for lack of a better word, because we have this problem. What do we call this space? Because a theater within a Eurocentric theater structure is not what we're intending to set up. But what's at the center here, and I'm coming on to an answer to your question, where do we want to go with this work? It is a form of decolonialization, where knowledge, power, and body as beings are three pillars of decolonial theory, in my view. In the German context, bodies, are very often left out of it. So body as a whole, as a totality, psychology, mental state, physical state, everything that is part of the body. And that's something that in a performative, artistic, theatrical context, it can be spoken word. That's also performance. It's word. It's spoken word. Nevertheless, power and knowledge are two important components. And this holistic physical approach, this approach to the body, is the aim of this new space or stage, that we as black bodies can see a space. And to use the words of Audre Lorde, we 
are functioning in a space where we're never meant to survive. We're given this in our cradles, this need to survive, this fight to survive, this need to come up with strategies all the time, especially when we're young and we are we often despair. I've seen it again and again, whether they're small children or teenagers in puberty or students that I teach at some point, students of color, black students who are tussling with their survival strategies, assuming they actually get that far in the first place. And this is something that we see as a holistic approach, where care and healing, of course, are part of the process, they're processes in themselves, and part of the overall process. It's not something that began with us and our bodies. This is what we would call ancestral healing. It's about our spirituality and also our biology, because it's rooted in our DNA. It's transported through our DNA. These things need to be nameable. Knowledge for me is not just things that are taught at European universities, that's part of a knowledge canon that for us as black people has always informed us, from which we've always sought and derived energy in the sense of power and knowledge. These are the sources of our creativity, in fact. And if we come on now to the rather untypical approach to black studies that I have and why, to me, the arts are so important, we need to take the arts on board here, certainly. Not just to investigate them from an existing institution, but to go into a space where the body is itself a center, is itself a focus, and can move within that space, can work within that space creatively, and produce within that space. And like I said, these are long-lasting processes that go beyond ourselves and our thinking. We need to be part of that process again. That's the way I see it, that all this Eurocentrist madness has catapulted it out of our thinking. Crystallization, missionization of the African continent was about removing us, separating us off from our spirituality, stealing our magic, if you like. And I think that is an empowering way to go, and it completely be linked to what the others are saying here. a way to approach this institutionalization which is already happening, that's the way we would imagine the process to pick up this idea that Vanessa came up with, the organization of the process. And that's a process that we are currently engaged in, this organizational process. Who wants to join us here? Who wants to be part of this space? Who understands and wants to go this way with us? It's one of many possible strategies and ways, like I said. But we're doing it. We're on the case. Thank you. Yes. Really, you've pinched all my cues here. You've mentioned healing, dying, and non-knowledge. I think these all belong together. Now, I'm not going to talk about Europe dying here. I really need to hear about the context first. But in a healing process, things have to die. And maybe not die in the sense of drama. We can translate it perhaps into unlearning. And that is the essence, after all, of decolonialization. Healing is also partly shifting the focus from this dilemma perspective that we have, that we have to uh, 
deal with so many different perspectives at once. We can replace it with our communities, with what we're doing. And a lot of the work we're doing is about that. This concentration on unlearning the legitimations, the epistemologies, to stick with knowledge as a theme. We've internalized all these things ourselves. We all have a colonial archive of knowledge within us. We only have to call up a few of these things, a few images. We all have these images in our mind's eye. When we talk about those inner images, we know what we have to retrieve from our memories and how to work with those. Vanessa's talked about memory here, too, and what it means to actually review the institutionalization itself and challenge it. We have to do it within ourselves. We all know what it means if we have to produce reports to legitimate what we're doing. It starts with the university. What source are we drawing on? How do we prove that the work we're doing is legitimate? And what is not legitimate? We have to be able to place some faith in this and to learn to value collective experience and collective knowledge production. It's a process, and that is a, the work of healing. It's not something you can just switch on and say, as from today, I'm going to appreciate this knowledge differently. We're familiar with this. This happens with delegitimization. If we can think, act within spaces, present our projects, position ourselves, learning to cope with these things, but also you spoke about having a space or stage within our movements so that we know how to go about getting that legitimation, but not patting ourselves on the backs. We need a calm, composed space. And yes, then we can say we have a tradition, this is it. So there's a link here to healing and a link between healing and dying. And the third cue here, non-knowledge. Yeah, we all have this colonial archive of knowledge, and all of us were trained in colonial structures. We were all trained in structural racism and its structures. We know that. We talk a lot about it, and we try to eliminate it, that colonial history is not taught, it's not visible, and therefore, colonial continuities are not visible. And all of this has impacts on us, but it also applies to us. It has an impact on how our bodies are seen in public discourse, and we have to deal with that trauma. But it's not just that. It also applies to us. We also have this non-knowledge ourselves, and we have to address that, which means that we have an entitlement, and we can make a demand of it, that these processes, these opportunities for knowledge are available to us. That's part of healing. Not simply always having to recruit our strategies from a white canon of knowledge. It's extremely arduous. And that was part of what Vanessa meant. Yes, counter strategies, they're there too. They're important too. But we need an approach in our own communities, which are intergenerational. We're not a homogeneous mass. In our movement history and experience, we have different intergenerational experience as well. And to be able to draw on that and to value it and pass it on and to look ahead as well as looking back, absolutely. Thank you very much. That point about intergenerality, I think, was very important. And also that there are so many different groups and communities and that it's important to have networking and linking and connections and to reinforce those. And I think Germany is rather a special case here because here the community is very heterogeneous, and 
And there are very different origins or places that people come from, to put it that way. So I think it's very important that Vanessa raised the class issue, which plays a key role here. We were aware of it. I think we're now all aware of it, that black studies is a very complex matter. I think it's important and it's challenging. In the complexity, there is a truth, because life, reality, is very complex, and it is a challenge to find strategies to do justice to that complexity that give a space to everyone and give everyone the space they need to operate in. So it's about being process-driven and growing organically and learning and building on each other and growing together. At this point, I would quite like to open up to questions from the audience. You've had time to prepare things. First of all, thank you for this great talk. It's wonderful to be here. I have a question. How can we connect black studies better with the struggle out in the streets? How can we boost solidarity there? We know that there have been a lot of achievements. Black Lives Matter in the last few years, the abolition of slavery before that, all of those were not achieved within institutions, but through people going out to demonstrate in the streets, often using violent means. Yet nonetheless, it seems to me that the academic world, which is sometimes very elitist, is drifting away from those struggles out in the streets and squares. So how is it possible to ensure that both movements pursue the same struggle, pursue the same goal? How is it possible to ensure that academic discourse is the only discourse viewed as being legitimate, whereas direct confrontation struggles out in the street, which often don't have a university or academic background, are viewed as being less legitimate. How is it possible to do that? Vanessa, do you want to reply? We've got a question I'd like to put back. But if Vanessa, if you wanted to say something, well, maybe you want to ask your, retur your question. Go ahead. But I'd love to say something about this. Yes, I felt even on Zoom that you were um, to say something. Well, I have to say I don't share your view. First of all, thank you very much for that question. I think it's a fascinating question. But I have to say, I don't think there is this kind of separation or distinction. You touched on a whole host of different points. One of those is perception. We could talk about that. But this idea that they're not connected one with the other is something that I believe is generally not the case, specifically with reference to Germany. That really isn't the case. So the struggles on the ground, the struggles in the street, for example, to combat racial profiling, protesting about the murder of Orijalo. Marianne Sa and others were also murdered, and there have been protests about that the German variant of Say Her Name. I can think of a whole list of examples. In some cases, exactly the same people who are involved in those protests and involved in academia. We need to be careful with the pitfall of reception as to who pronounces the legitimacy. You're saying, well, academic discourse or black knowledge production in the academy or academies is viewed as being legitimate and the others are not. 
if you compare one with the other now from through a certain prism that might appear to be the case, but I don't think that really is the case. But we've been discussing here for over an hour that the legitimacy of black knowledge production in the academy simply does not exist. So that's already a structure that's often deployed. We've talked about so many aspects that are needed and saying, well, you know, the people out in the streets demonstrating don't understand you. I mean, you didn't put it exactly like that, but it's because of this kind of loop. How can we connect these elements? We need to say absolutely clearly for decades now, we've been doing both. And largely what you see in universities nowadays has grown directly out of those protests from the situation on the spot, from the communities, from the movements. I'm saying this so vehemently because it's problematic. There's a question of labelling here. It's a bit like always putting us into a particular drawer. You've got developments and processes and movements being put into particular drawers or categories and separated one from the other. And then to subsequently say, well, now break out of those categories. That's what Toni Morrison said when she said that racism is there to distract us, to keep us busy. That means that we're busy now pronouncing that we're not classist, that we also talk the language of the streets. Whereas if you look at intersectionality, that's apparently such a complex concept now is associated with three black working class women. And now everyone is using that term. That's an interesting background. I know you didn't say exactly that, but um, these are important points. Well, I wanted to add something. I hope you didn't get the wrong of the stick about what I was saying. It's very important in terms of repression as well. There's a lot of criminalization of protests and the struggle in the street and it's criminalized. It's not precisely the black perspective, the black studies perspective. That's not necessarily my focus, but really what the whole society can do to ensure that these struggles out on the street are not criminalized in the way in which they are at present and are not so repressed, whether we look at um, scrapping Germany or scrapping the police or whatever. That's, that's the issue, really. Perhaps I could comment on that. I think Peggy made very clear what kind of problems are associated with this kind of approach. Although I'm not quite sure if you're reading it in those terms. Let's say something about solidarity and repression in a moment. I wanted to underline that this question of theory and practice, those in the streets, those at universities, are viewed as being in different categories. Now, it's important. The university is in a specific site of struggle. What's the situation there? I think it's important to look at that and to look beyond that, but also to look at it in connection to other aspects. But as Peggy has already said, many people do that already. There are a lot of black scholars, black radical feminist scholars are also activists. That's why you have this idea of the scholar activist that the Germans or Germany dislikes so much, but that's the background. It's because of this link that it does exist, but precisely because scholars have a certain kind of access to the university and have a certain degree of responsibility consequently. So it's important to also look at the question of the class struggle within black communities that exists in the US and in Europe, that's a topic as well. African feminists constantly address these issues as well. The black, poor, rural communities are also really 
one of the key points that they're affected by severe exploitation. We need to think about this in Europe from the perspective of the Black Mediterranean, where thousands of people are systematically drowned, and then we move far, far beyond the institutional framework, looking at what this signifies. And of course, there's an intermeshing here, but in black studies, there's also a radical critique of racial gender capitalism and in the necropolitics that these systems produce, and not only, in inverted commas, the institutional dimension of racism. There's also the question of the global dimension of extractivism and multiple exploitation. So I think that's very important before I say a little bit about repression. Sylvia Winter, an Afro-Caribbean feminist philosopher and theatre maker, as Natasha has always said, this all hangs together in 91 when there were the riots in LA, the rebellion. I think it's also bad to say riots because Martin Luther King, I think, reclaimed that word. But anyway, this rebellion broke out in LA, and she wrote a letter to black colleagues. No humans involved, a letter to my colleagues. And I think it's very important. As black academics, we need to marry our thoughts with the downtrodden, with the wretched of the earth. That's the commitment that we have to make. And in that context, then, of course, we're looking beyond the institutions we're involved in. That form of commitment is important, in my view, in order to show that we can have a more liberal strand as well. Of course, black people are not a homogenous group. Think about the situation globally. So these struggles, of course, are always intersectional on various different strata. I think it's very important to link this into what's happening on the continent of what African feminists are doing within the university, certainly African German gender studies, Afro-feminism studies. They're often intermeshed. There is a kind of a development project there, but feminists there, Afro-feminists try to undermine and subvert that, and also try to connect their studies with the impoverished population. There's so many different movements, so many different groups on the spot that really demonstrate exactly how, as well, white people can do something as well, and people across the board can act. So yes, you are thinking about people being white and getting involved on the left, so they can be bourgeois and become involved. It's really about intersectionality. There are students, there are activists that I work with, of course. There's reasons why Christy Schulich was shot and I wasn't, for example. She was a first-generation migrant. She was dark-skinned. She was on benefits. And I think all of these dimensions are important as well. You have to talk about those. Even being politicized affects people differently depending on their status. It affects, for example, the undocumented differently. It affects people from a migrant background differently. We all need to show solidarity, but I believe that people who are not affected by this kind of racial lies, policing can learn a great deal from those who say, well, support us with campaigns, intervene. For example, if the Police is doing stop and search, get involved in funding, activist strategies, as well as a whole host of different groups involved in this. There's Migrantifa, for example. There's a lot of new black radical groups as well. 
if you're asking the question, well, what can people do? They've shown what can be done. We need to think about the way in which the police t deals with us differently. What you can do if you see racial profile, if you see repression, how you can make more noise about problems and protect those who are more vulnerable to police violence, how we can support them, how can we stand by their side and take some of the burden off their shoulders, how can we pull our resources and redistribute those resources. There's a whole host of different ways to act. A lot of groups have already done a great deal on that. They've shared information. They've called for people to take action. So that, I hope, is part of an answer to your question, to take a look at what organized groups have long been doing and calling for when it comes to questions of solidarity and the forms that those could take. Thank you, Vanessa. Thank you for pointing to what is possible now, what we can do now, and can pick up on immediately and also take action. And unfortunately, we've run out of time for this panel. Thank you very much, Peggy, for being with us. Thank you for your important input. Thank you, Natasha, for being here with us. I was delighted that you were with us. So we're going to continue now, handing over to Nairobi, the other objects. What a shame we didn't have time for more questions from the audience, but I think it's been made very clear that this is a broad, multifaceted topic, and meeting is part of the solution, part of the process. So thank you all very much.